Equitech Futures uh, is a global fellowship for emerging innovators who are interested in using technology to solve societal challenges worldwide. Um, the fellowship was founded in 2020, um, and this is going to be our fourth Applied Data Institute that we are running this fall or, or uh, between October and December uh, of 2024. Um, the Equitech Futures program uh, or Equitech Futures organization uh, also runs institutes for undergraduates as well as those who are working in the social sector who are interested in uh, engaging civic tech. So those are the Equitech Scholars Program and the Civic Tech Institute, respectively. But we're here today to talk about the Applied Data Institute, uh, which are for folks like you who have come from computational science backgrounds uh, and are, are interested in data science, interested in the application of your programming skills and your mathematical and data science skills toward societal challenges. The Applied Data Institute runs over the course of 10 weeks. Um, the dates this year are from October 7th through December 20th, um, so toward the end of this year. Um, and our aim is that uh, through our live cohort-based coursework, uh, you will wind up learning skills in data science, in artificial intelligence, in entrepreneurship, and in how to communicate your ideas to, to various publics um, so that you can make a substantial impact in the world, advance in your respective careers. Um, and the timing of that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it's a live cohort-based program. The Applied Data Institute meets Monday through Friday over the course of those 10 weeks between 1300 and 1600 coordinated universal time, UTC. Um, that's kind of around this time of day, wherever you are joining in your time zone. Um, it, it starts about an hour earlier than this uh, meeting uh, commenced and runs until about two hours after this meeting commenced. So it's a three hour block every day. Um, you can also use Google to translate what is 1300 UTC in your time zone and it'll it'll tell you right away. This is uh, different from a MOOC, from a massive online open course where you would sign up, uh, you would get asynchronous modules for you to complete at your own pace. Um, and uh, and you essentially direct your forward momentum through that program. We at Equitech have felt like that's a fine model for some people, but a lot of learners want to engage in these new ideas in community where they're able to discuss with faculty live, um, where they're able to coordinate and collaborate on projects with their fellow uh, institute students. And so it is a commitment that one makes if you are accepted into the Applied Data Institute that you will carve out those hours for the course of those 10 weeks um, and show up camera on, uh, willing to jump into the conversation because we will do it together. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that we pride ourselves on and that we find is novel about our institute programming at Equitech Futures. Um, I think we'll speak about the application process because here it is June that we're already starting the application process for a program that begins in October. Ayushi is going to lead us through that process and, and tell us the different steps and what to anticipate. Hello everyone. Um, so if you can put your attention to the chat for just one second, in case any of what I'm about to say right now seems overwhelming to you and you're worried about recalling this at a later stage there's you can go ahead and find all the instructions at the link that Anodia has just posted if you go on our website on the adi homepage, you can also find this link in the admissions section of the website i'll right now talk about what is the application procedure for the applied data institute because as thomas has mentioned right it's a little weird for a course to which starts in october to open programs like open applications in june itself 
The reason we've done that is because this application is quite intensive, a three stage process. The first stage, so if you've had a look at the eligibility criteria for the Applied Data Institute, it includes fluency in Python, specifically things like NumPy, Panda, and Matplotlib. And um, the reason for that is because the first stage itself is a 24 hour Python assessment test. So if you're not comfortable with, or if you're not fluent in Python as a language, this test is designed to figure that out for us. Uh, we, this application process happens. So if you go on the Applied Data Institute's website, you will find the link to this Python assessment test right now, which is open for everyone. You go ahead and you submit your details in a sign up form. And then accordingly you get, so if you're not from China, you get access to a Google Colab notebook, which you're supposed to, which has all the questions listed on it already that you're supposed to edit within 24 hours, because at the end of 24 hours, the notebook auto submits itself. And similarly, if you're from China, you'll go ahead and receive an email from us, an automated email with a Python notebook attached that we expect you to download, edit, and upload on the form link that is also included in that email, again, within 24 hours from the time that you got that email. This is a time-bound application process. So please do not submit your details into the sign-up form unless you have 24 hours to go ahead and take the exam right then. Because at the end of 24 yeah, hours, we they are not seeing you. one second, I'll just, yeah, at the, thank you. At the end of 24 hours, we will not, like, if you're using a Google Colab notebook, you will lose access to the notebook itself. So you can't edit it anymore. And similarly, any submissions we get of the notebook itself, we will not be accepting submissions after the 24 hour guideline. The deadline for this is July 12th. After the applicants who go ahead and make it through the pre-screen assessment will then be invited to submit a written application to us. Again, the timeline for that will be from August 1st to August 16th. The people who have not made it through the Python pre-screen assessment, we'll reach out to them by August 15th similarly. And then after clearing the written applications process, you will be invited with an interview with the faculty in the week of September 2nd, which is why this, day, this application cycle starts when it does to go ahead and give everyone involved in the admission process, the faculty, but also more importantly, the applicants to test the waters and make sure there's time to prepare for every subsequent application stage. And yeah, that's the application process. And if you clear all three, then I will be seeing you for the orientation that happens in the week of October 2nd. Yes, I think over to you back again, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I'm sure I, I know some of the questions that were pre-submitted were wondering, tell me about this curriculum. Tell me about what it is that we are going to be studying. Um, and so there are uh, four major courses uh, that you'll wind up undertaking in the course of the Applied Data Institute. Uh, and we thought that it would be uh, great for you to hear from our alumni speaking about some of those courses and what their experiences are. Um, so for the Foundations of Data Science and Programming, I think that was Linda who was going to speak about that. Great, over to you, Linda. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. So if we are talking about Foundation of Data Science and Programming, this is a good course and a good unit that is taught at Equitech Futures under ADI. So first of all, I like the Data Science and Programming because the major focus was understanding the fundamental statistics principles that underpin data science with artificial intelligence. So what I mean by this, my experience was, if you look at the tutor that was teaching us, this was not just about crunching numbers. It was about developing a solid foundation in statistical running, statistical reasoning, sorry. So this was a good opportunity because through Hansen project and data sets, I was able to develop the ability to apply these principles practically. This foundation has been instrumental in my career, being a data analyst and also a data scientist. It has allowed me to tackle complex data problems with confidence because right now I have good statistical reasonings to tackle my world problems. Also, we went ahead and we were taught about a critical approach to data visualization. So the key takeaways was to critical to critically analyze and visual and visualize the data. So during the course, we explored different methods and techniques to present the data in different ways. And what I can say, this has been available in my work as a data scientist and a data analyst, and it has enabled me to com to communicate complex statistical findings clearly and persuasively. And also. 
we were also taught about exploring mathematical concept. This indicated like uh, learning about various topics such as we had topics such as um, the heuristic biases, fintech statistics, Bayesha's inference, probability. So understanding how data science works in practice came in hand with these mathematical concepts. And also we demonstrated the ability and intent applicability to data science as career and AI also as career, because this was connected directly also to machine learning programs. So overall, this has been a very important unit and this will lead you directly to solve real world problems when it comes to dealing with data and also statistical reasoning. Thank you so much. Yeah, I also want to quickly add up to Linda. For me, especially with uh, the Foundation Data Science, uh, I loved when I had the chance to collaborate with my cohort members. Like we had a lot of those sessions where Pasi uh, gave us the notebooks and we, we had to collaborate with each other and find out the solution. For me, I, it felt so uh, nice with, because like every other week or every other day or every other session, we were matched with different uh, cohort members and to collaborate with different um, members, different colleagues from different part of the world was, I think one of my favorite from all of what Linda said. So yeah. One thing I want to add here, which is slightly different to just the specific curriculum, but if I think back to like my college, like math courses, they were all like very straightforward, right? Theory, practice, like do this, do that, whatever. I think in this course, we discussed mathematics and statistics a lot, which was very different to what I was used to. And another thing that I really appreciated is it was very challenging. It wasn't easy, which, you know, might seem like a bit of a stupid thing to bring up, but I think math for, I think a lot of people on this call, like people who are more computationally focused, math was probably pretty straightforward, especially like, you know, the basic math you learn in school is probably very straightforward. I think the way Basi approached learning was very, you know, it was very challenging. It did make you think. And that's why these collaboration exercises that Labi also brought up were very necessary because you really, they couldn't figure it out by yourself you had to collaborate so just like another aspect to bring out especially like if you are thinking about like how to challenge yourself a little bit more how to expose yourself like a new way of thinking this course definitely was a way for me to do that within the ADI. Posse, it must be lovely and, and maybe even a little weird to hear uh, alumni speaking of your class and speaking of its impact. I'm just, before we move on to our next class, I wonder if there's anything that you wanted to add about the Foundations of Data Science course, since you're the instructor of it. Um, yeah, I think I think the only thing I would want to add is that um, every year I try and do things slightly differently. Um, and so historically, the lenses through which um, we've sort of looked at data science as a discipline is the kind of, is, 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 is if you were to sort of think of it as a Venn diagram, you're bringing in three lenses. There's a computer science programming lens, a probability statistics lens, and sort of a philosophy epistemology lens. And what I'm hoping to do in the next ADI is to bring in one more lens, and this is sort of an economics lens. So I'm looking forward to trying that out for the first time. One thing we're passionate about at Equitech is we're always um, experimenting and trying new things and trying to push our pedagogy uh, to new levels. So there's going to be some new stuff that uh, the folks here would not be able to talk about, but I'm hoping, I'm, I'm very excited about it. So that's the only thing I'll, I'll have to add for now. That's exciting, Posse. Thank you. Um, let's uh, move on in the curriculum uh, to uh, our Applied Artificial Intelligence course. Uh, was it Tina? Uh, Tina. Or, Tina was yeah. the one who wanted to speak about that me. first. Great. Yeah. So for everyone on the call, as Basi just mentioned, the team is constantly revamping the curriculum. So if I mention anything about curriculum, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. It might be a little bit different for whenever you join. I think whatever I say about my own experience, that's what you should be taking away from it. But in the artificial intelligence class, I think kind of very broadly, Abilash covers everything at a very like 
wide scale from the implementation of the AI and machine learning models that are available out there to the impact that they have in the world. And we look at it at like various different levels. It's everything from like how they really work at a technical level um, to like how what kind of an impact they might have on the business. One thing I really appreciated is that we actually brought actual kind of business conversation into the class. You know, how does Netflix do it? How does Facebook do it? Like, what does this look like? Like this random application of voice detection and, and, you know, detecting like shootings in LA and what kind of impact that had in the cities, like that kind of stuff, like really bringing actual businesses that attempted to implement AI models and what kind of impact they had on the communities or the societies or whatever scale they were they were working in. I think the reason why I really like this class is because it made me look look at the like everything around us, everything that has to do with machine learning, even if it's just like basic prediction or like basic automation models a little bit differently it definitely makes you think a little bit more about like specifically for me I think it was like how was this data collected and like what's the quality of this data and like can I trust this and like what is this you know gonna mean later on um and yeah and I think it's just like it I think the reason why I liked it so much is like it opened more questions for me than it answered and I really liked it because especially where we are right now so in 2022 in December when we were just finishing like my cohort yeah. chat GPT just came out right so it, like chat GPT the first one just came out so we were just playing around with it in the course I was not anticipating what happened now so and I think like seeing kind of the entire the development and having the learnings I have from the class to be able to kind of critically evaluate it and like kind of understand where it's coming from has been insanely impactful for me. And beyond that, obviously, you know, with the development of ChatGPT, I'm not sure how many of you are in a full-time positions, but I think like a lot of the companies in whatever different industries they are right now are trying to implement various different like AI, AI technologies right now. That's the same for me, right? Like we definitely have various different strategies of automation going on and having the knowledge and like having the ability to critically analyze what is needed to implement all of these AI models is definitely helping me be way better at my job um, right now. And I do think I have like a bit of an advantage over my peers because of the learnings of this class, specifically because of the AI class and because of like the discussions we had in the sphere. So, yeah. so that's very briefly, but I'm sure uh, Linda and Labi want to add something to it. Yes, I think I can just add also a, a platform like uh, maybe implementing the more decent automation. Uh, the class also taught us like when it comes to AI ethical considerations when dealing with AI and also when deploying a models. And also uh, just to add on that, uh, when you came like on this uh, cohort, we came in Maybe yes, you have those skills and you have something, but you've never created something. Like you've never used AI, you've never like uh, taken maybe a further step, maybe to tackle a real world problem. So for us, we were divided into groups of our cohort. We were with Labby. So you had that opportunity, like oh, to look at the world, to look at various challenges that are facing the world, and this gives you like an opportunity. Having gotten the skills, having directed by Abilash, you are now able to see like oh, so this is something that I can solve, and it gives you a huge impact because you can really see. Like, like the world and maybe try to implement something that can solve a real world challenge using AI and maybe implementing with machine learning. So that was a better experience to myself because it helps you integrate and be ready to solve real world problems. Yeah. So I was really, really happy with that. Yeah. Um, adding up to whatever Tina and Linda said, I think for me, uh, one more thing that also added a lot of value uh, to this model, especially when, uh, so in our cohort, when we bring up any topic and then we all used to put our ideas to it, Abilash had his expertise uh, onto it and we had this whole chain of um, thread going on to that topic, which is really interesting because that also made me um, sit back and then observe how every one of us actually thought about those problems. So yeah, for me, it was very really conversational and that's something that uh, was really fun also.
Great lobby. And I, I think highlighting that conversational aspect is really one of the strengths of Equitech Futures programming, that we are doing this together, we're doing it in live time. And so as you have the excitement, as you have that discovery about something that someone else has said, you can get into the conversation and, and kind of stoke that fire right then and there. Uh, you don't have to wait to post it on a board and wait for someone to respond. It's all it's all very live. Hasi, I saw that you unmuted uh, as well. Do you want to yeah, sure, absolutely. I just wanted to briefly comment because Abhilash isn't himself here to speak about his course. Um, sort of thinking about his course from the standpoint of my course on data science, I like I often joke that my course is a worm's eye view of data science and AI, and his course is a bird's eye view. Um, and I think both of them, what they share is essentially it, the, both courses are a home for the kind of conversations that would never happen in MOOCs. So MOOCs are great for learning all sorts of technical skills, but I think both courses try to do something that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else and require a distinctly discursive environment where you can talk and 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 work through the deepest ideas um, uh, underlying these fields. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, uh, just to highlight perhaps more than add, is that Avilash, he's a physicist by training, but he's deeply knowledgeable in both policy um, and economics. And so he's he really is that expertise that it, I, I might say brings the applied into the Applied Data Institute. A very important point, Fasi. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, moving on in the curriculum, uh, we'll speak a bit about the communications lab and Lobby is uh, going to speak about that coursework in both speaking and writing. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for me, communication lab, uh, we had the combination of speaking lab and writing lab uh, previously. So uh, I can speak on to that experience. So both of these class actually had a lot of impact on me because with foundation of data science and applied AI, those um, classes models were um, very personal and professionally um, very much impactful for me as a professional data scientist. However, the communication lab was particularly valuable because coming from a place where these kind of opportunities to learn these skills are very limited and I found the speaking and writing labs to be extremely benefit because of that and yeah as a data scientist we often need to communicate our findings clearly to our stakeholders and our stakeholders could be anyone um, maybe someone with technical background or not so uh, I feel like these these classes did teach me a bit on how to effectively deliver the insights. And speaking about the speaking lab, uh, Thomas introduced like various techniques to us. I don't want to spoil a lot of uh, the fun things, but uh, the techniques like vocal warm up to presenting ideas through PowerPoint and also shout out to Ronak. Uh, he did make some guest appearance. Uh, he's an alumni. And we practiced like speaking different, like we also um, practiced our native languages with each other. So we were 13, we were from 13 different countries um, in our cohort. And we talked about our native languages also. So for me, speaking lab was very much special. And talking about writing lab, um, it was led by Kritika. And Kritika is someone who was, who was like, I, I think I've never met someone who's so passionate about writing. And I felt like that inspiration, that reflection also, somehow I felt very connected to it. And I think it was in Kritika's class, I think I actually uh, used pen and paper after a long time because I'm very much used to writing notes in uh, laptops or phones so it, it's there's nothing wrong doing that but it just felt so grounded um, and yeah we explored different types of writing and we learned how to present our ideas in various contexts and something amazing about uh, our mentor Kritika is like she's very much detail oriented when she gives feedback so we also had this paper where we needed to deliver and like the amount of feedback the, the very much constructive feedback that she gave us it was like we sat and we were we talked about how much 
time she must have invested in our work uh, to actually give us those kind of strong pointed uh, feedback. It was really amazing to go through all of those and discuss within our group. So yeah, for me, both speaking and writing lab as a communication lab um, with amazing mentors is like uh, something that I'm going to be grateful for all of my life. So thank you. I think the only thing I would add is that it was just both of those classes were really fun. They looked a little different for me than they would for all of you when you join, but um, they were just really fun. And I'm not going to spoil it, but the first article we read in Kritika's class, I still remember it. I think I could probably recite like <laughs> a couple of paragraphs because of how like how much detail we put into reading it and analyzing it and then thinking about it. So yeah, I could definitely echo like her passion. And yeah, speaking classes with Thomas were just like a lot of fun. So yeah, those those classes for me were just fun. Um, I definitely got a lot of value out of them, but they were just a lot of fun as well. Yeah, maybe maybe just to finalize, uh, even me just opening my camera just to talk to you guys, it's because of speaking lab. Like you are given that confidence, like these people like Thomas here, like he gives you that confidence, the vocality. So you can come to the people like all around and present anything that you want. Or let's say, for example, uh, when Labia said we have the writing lab. So the writing lab comes in, maybe you are a data scientist. You carried out your research, you have something you want to present it to the stakeholders. The speaking lab now kicks in because now you get that confidence. You can be able to talk in front of people and tell them, hey, look at this like confidently, like you don't shy of or something. So speaking lab was a lot of impact. And also writing lab comes in because now you are able to understand the way you'll share your ideas and insights to stakeholders or those people are presenting maybe your project to or the problems you're trying to solve on paper. Yeah, so that's all. Thanks, y'all. Um, I'll, I'll just add, since Kritika and I work quite closely together and, and we had two separate courses, the speaking lab and the writing lab that we're working this uh, this year to put together into kind of a united communications lab for this uh, upcoming Applied Data Institute. Um, but one of the kind of uh, main ideas for Kritika is that the practice of writing, the practice of articulating your ideas, as imperfect as they may be, they extend the life of that thought. They allow you the, the, the space and the time to go deeper and reflect and ruminate on them. And so to get yourself into a practice of writing, not for necessarily like perfect syntax and everything, though she does, as they mentioned, have very detailed feedback about such things, but about being able to hold on to your ideas in a way that is recorded um, it is uh, of critical importance. Um, and then the speaking lab also touches on this idea that that as much emphasis as you put, especially in the writing lab, on what it is you're going to say, how it is you wind up communicating it to others also winds up having a big impact, um, especially when you are speaking with somebody who might have influence in being able to take your ideas to the next level. And so knowing what those many choices are that you can make um, and how to be most effective in the way that you communicate these bright, brilliant ideas that, that we know that all of you have to others, um, that's that's why the communications lab becomes a key part, a, a cornerstone of our curriculum. The final class in the series is our entrepreneurship lab, um, which is, uh, a, a new module that was begun in part last year during the Applied uh, Data Institute. Uh, it's taught by my colleague, Linda Kinning, uh, who is the director of Equitech Ventures. You, if you were here at the very beginning of our call, you saw her uh, briefly on the video uh, in dialogue with Apilash. Um, and this is truly about how you can build your business toolkit and start thinking like an entrepreneur. There are many outcomes of these brilliant ideas that you have about how technology can meet uh, these societal challenges. But for a lot of people, there's also potentially a product there. There's something uh, that the market is hungry for in order to try to meet uh, this particular need. And so working with Linda over the course of the 10 weeks, you'll wind up identifying problems that you feel passionate about. Um, there's a whole module that I love uh, that she teaches about 
falling in love with problems, really trying to look at what is the problem landscape of the unique geography and the unique culture that you are a part of, and what are those problems that activate you? Oftentimes in business, we think about like, ooh, what are cool solutions that uh, can be applied uh, in the world? And so you create solutions that go looking for problems. Instead, Linda leads uh, a process where you can fall in love with a problem first that really activates you and that you think might be able to garner stakeholder support in that community that you're a part of, and then progress through the business plan for it. How do you de-risk your assumptions Um, How do you approach solutions with a human-centered lens since societal problems always impact humans on the far end? Uh, And all of this leads towards a capstone project where in collaboration uh, with the data science class, the uh, artificial intelligence class, and the communications lab, you will wind up writing a memo Um, articulating the architecture for an AI implementation that uh, doesn't yet exist, but that you think might meet a really critical problem set. Um, And then you will wind up pitching that that implementation uh, to the faculty and to your fellow cohort members uh, in a panel format. Um, So the Entrepreneurship Lab really looks at at bringing business into the application as well of how you as a trained data scientist and, and an uh, artificial intelligence practitioner uh, can wind up helping to solve big problems. Uh, Linda and Lobby had a little bit of that last year. I don't know if, the, if either one of you had anything that you wanted to add from, from that process. And it's okay if you don't. Uh, yeah, so I do want to add a little bit on it. Um, so, f- yeah, we did not have a lot of class on it. But uh, what I do remember is like mapping out our problems and trying to find not solution at in the beginning, like thinking about the problems, like what, what, what problem does um, the thing that is happening around you bothers you, like coming up with listing down the problems and then trying to uh, slowly come up to the solution who could be our user to that solution are we are we capable of solving that do we have the resources is it highly valuable or not to solve those so we had a lot of I, I guess in those uh, session that we had we had a lot of thinking uh, we tried to brainstorm a lot of ideas with each other. So we we were from different countries and we tried to bring up the ideas. And and one thing that we did uh, during the whole cohort, during the whole session was we came up with this uh, last white paper, which was also an uh, idea that generated from this session. And uh, even now uh, with my group, we talk about trying to solve this problem. Uh, so yeah, it, it was actually a really brainstorming uh, session that we did and it was really helpful. I hope we also had this whole long-term uh, course, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, as, as Posse mentioned earlier, we're all the faculty is always trying to innovate uh, what would wind up serving students in this year most effectively. And so the Entrepreneurship Lab um, was a smaller module as an experiment last year. Uh, it, it felt really effective. And so it is being expanded into a full uh, a full part of the 10 week course this year um, on kind of equal footing as the AI uh, uh, data science and communications courses. Shall we move on to talk about the Equitech experience? Um, let me uh, hand it over to An- Anodia, who we haven't heard from uh, for a little while, to talk to us a bit about the alumni network. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, so first of all, I think a lot has been covered with just talking about the curriculum, the different kinds of uh, classes we have had, and the different experiences that alumni have had. 
but uh, the reason the alumni are here today to talk to you to do this info session is because we are very invested in our alumni and our alumni i think are very invested uh, in the kind of experience that they have had with equitech futures so if you thought you know your experience with this program just gets over in the 10 to 12 week of course that you do with equitech futures that is not uh, that is not what this is um the entire for example right now we have around 126 alumni from 50 different countries so even though like we are spread across different regions different countries people come from various professional backgrounds there are some people there are some alumni who are still in their undergraduate courses whereas we whereas we have some who are working in like different places um in climate in tech in education the one thing that binds everyone together is this is this passion for social impact, entrepreneurship, data science and AI and how all of these come together. So, so yeah, what I mean to say is that we are very invested in our alumni, in their stories, um, and some of the experience, some of the opportunities that we provide after this uh, course is over, after you are done, uh, a after you have done a course with us, um, are the research labs, the venture studio. Uh, thanks, Nanad the research labs, the venture studio, and an overall mentorship, uh, and obviously the global IRL conferences, which we will uh, speak about and share a little uh, sneak peek in some time. But just speaking about the research uh, labs and venture studio, I think here I would also love if Thomas and uh, Bhasi can jump in whenever uh, possible. Um, we have had alumni who have extended their capstone projects after a course to do more research with us. For example, one of the first ventures that Equitech started was uh, through an alumni, through an ADI alumni, an Applied Data Institute, because this alumni was very passionate about climate change and uh, one of uh, yeah, the, uh, the enterprises called Measuring Carbon, and you can also check more about it through our website. Uh, similarly, we have had more alumni come to us and pitch research uh, projects with us and our faculty sit with them, give them time, talk to them, research, uh, soundboard these entire ideas, flesh them out, and then these people join us as research fellows. The Venture Fellows, on the other hand, is an extension of the Entrepreneurship Lab, which you will see in this course, but also the Venture Studio. Uh, but also the Innovation Institute. So uh, currently, as we speak, we have the first Innovation uh, Institute in session at Equitech Futures. And the Innovation Institute, again, is something which is exclusively for alumni. These are alumni who have in the past, through their courses, through the different conversations, shown a certain uh, interest and passion for a certain problem that they would like to solve. Uh, and we have these selected alumni who are part of the Innovation Institute and they work directly with Linda to talk more about their ideas and then finally come up with an uh, uh, enterprise of their own, a uh, company of their own. And I think the the main part, something that makes us different here in with regards to other venture studios is that Equitech Futures is also part of this founding team. So you get a lot of time and attention from our faculty. Um, so yeah, that's about the research labs and venture studio. Bhasi and Thomas, is there anything that you would like to add here? Since I think you have worked more closely there. I think I was relatively thorough. Th these are paid uh, opportunities for uh, yeah. that are exclusive for Equitech alumni. Um, and so the research labs are, are th thought of as kind of being like a part-time research fellowship. Um, working in ventures can be a, a more extensive uh, commitment uh, as you work with a team, generally a team of other alumni, oftentimes from across cohorts on building out a particular venture. Um, but you're a part of the Equitech Futures team uh, compensated as a staff member in that process uh, as we as Linda, Abilash and, and the rest of the faculty and staff work to try to bring uh, that venture to market, to, um, to to be able to achieve impact and achieve scale uh, in your region of, uh, of, of impact. So uh, those are opportunities that come after the 10-week program. And then uh, we also gather our alumni uh, at regular intervals. Usually we try to move to different regions around the world uh, and do what we call these IRL conferences, uh, IRL standing for in real life, a throwback to kind of my late 90s, early 2000s chat room 
uh, culture. Um, but uh, truly, we do we gather our alumni in person, as you saw in the video at the top. We've already gathered uh, alumni in New Delhi, uh, in Nairobi, in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, in Chicago, in the United States. Uh, most recently uh, in Oxford in the United Kingdom, and then most recently we were in Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, with our South Asian alumni. Uh, Labi was there with us at the, in Kathmandu, and I'm wondering, Labi, if you want to speak about what that, hey, look, there's a photo of you too there. Um, if you want to speak about what that experience was like uh, meeting alumni and meeting the faculty in person. Definitely, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, I think those three days were like, I cannot convert that into words, but I'll try to. Um, so yeah, being a part of ADI and studying in the four corners of the screen, like being together, collaborating with each other, uh, being with the faculty member every day, it was already enriching. But again, the the connection that we find um the personal connection, the in real life connection that we actually find with each other. I think that was only possible because of the in real life. Um, so it was an extraordinary experience. And I was, I I think I I was I I thought like I was really lucky to be a recent graduate and then to attend in real life that also in my home country to be alumni host and to take everyone um, of you around to see Pashupati, which is one of the, um, yeah, the, uh, the culturally very significant place. And so from engaging um, conversation to everything about politics, to social science, to potential collaboration within our alumni community, everything was so fulfilling. We shared our ideas, discussed our culture, and we often like stayed up all night talking about all of these things. So making those three days really, really short. Um, I made some friends, uh, which was not those who were not in my cohort. They were alumni from different other um, modules and from different years. So I made a lot of friends and some of us are also planning to do some kind of catch up later this year, if that's possible, if everything goes well. We have like hiking plans. So all of these collaboration plans were made and yeah, also meeting the faculty in person, like after seeing them on screen, I think it also created a, a unique and like a deep bond. The human connection we formed like in real life, um, definitely it felt closer than ever before. And I'm grateful that Equitech organizes these events. And I highly recommend anyone who participate in this like if you are if you're selected, then do participate in real life. You get to learn a lot from each other. Um, from experienced uh, from experienced professionals to like brainstorming ideas on climates and social science there's like different uh, different alumni from different walks of life so I definitely learned a lot in that three days I would also just like to add something here that um, at this point of time when we were planning the IRL all our Nepal alumni was so helpful with just helping us with the entire uh, you know, logistics as hosts uh, of this uh, IRL. So just a shout out there uh, to Labi and the others. Um, I also just want to speak a little more about what we do virtually apart from these IRLs. Since these IRLs are um, events that we have maybe twice or thrice a year, we uh, do have other virtual events that happen every month. For example, we have faculty coffee chats, uh, leadership labs, uh, where we have industry experts come and speak to our alumni. Uh, and we also just have like social hours where, you know, alumni from different cohorts want to just sit together and play like code names. So they ha there have been like a group of people who have uh, managed to conduct these events also. So uh, these are also a part of the Equitech alumni experience. Um, so, yeah. I think uh, you know if there's an if there's a thread between these online experiences as well as the IRL experiences, it's that um, while you will make deep and meaningful relationships over those ten weeks, I think with the members of your cohort, you are joining a larger um, cohort of alumni uh, across the years, and you are all bound, even though you may come from wildly different uh, countries, continents, cultures, speak different languages. 
you are all bound by the common thread that you are interested in how tech can wind up making a social impact. Um, and so uh, it, it astounds me and thrills me how quickly at these IRL conferences, folks from other cohorts just like instantly fall into conversation with each other. And, and as Lobby mentioned, friendships can be made very, very quickly in that uh, intense amount of time because what your orientation is toward how tech can make for a better world, that's what you all have in common. Um, it's a strong foundation uh, of, of commonality. Okay, we have been um, talking, I think, for a lot longer than we yeah, were planning to, so we need to move on to our question and answer period. So um, all of you who have joined us on the call, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we'll invite you. If you have questions that you would like to drop into the chat, you're willing to, you're, you're welcome to do that. If you want to hit the raise your hand uh, button at the bottom and uh, raise your hand and join a queue and then unmute and speak your question, um, we'd like to make sure that we get to all of them. Um, and we'll also consult the list of uh, some of you who had pre-submitted uh, questions. Thomas, I think uh, I can start with one of the questions go. which uh, yeah, which we had from uh, the pre-submitted form. Um, so yeah, the first question was, what's the coursework time like on work days? Uh, we have already mentioned the time, but I think if someone could talk about just balancing work and the course, uh, that would be great. Any of the alumni, uh, since I, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, were, were any of you working full time at the same time that you were doing the ADI? And and if so, what was that balance like? Tina, you were, were you? Yeah, or I was. I was working full time. Um, I'm not gonna say it was like super easy. First of all, I don't I don't want to set like wrong expectations. I did get the buy in from my company at the time. I was very straightforward about this because the time commitment is significant. Three hours every day plus you know whatever stuff you have to do on the side. Like it does add up. Depending on what time zone you're in, you also might have to zoom into the classes during the work time. So obviously, like, you know, keep that in mind. For me, it worked out pretty well because the classes were 5 to 8 p.m. So it was towards like the second part of my workday. Um, so I did get the kind of like just the buy in from my bosses. They were OK with it. They were very supportive about it. So it worked out OK. I will say that, you know, during those 10 weeks that I was doing the ADI, I was not as productive in my full-time job as I was outside of it. Like it definitely does require some commitment. So I think it's possible to balance. It also, look, frankly, it also depends on like what your full-time job looks like. Mine is quite demanding, a lot more than just like a nine to five. So take all of that into account. Um, but yeah, I would say, I think accounting for the time commitment, I would be careful making a decision whether you're actually ready to do this because it's not going to be like the easiest thing you've done. I think it's worth it, but I do think you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. And if it does fall within kind of your work time, I would definitely say like, discuss this with your superiors and your company just so you don't get into any trouble <laughs> because of this. Also, if I can add something right here. So on top, I think generally what our alumni have found is that a total time period of about 20 to 25 hours per week outside of your regular class hours is something that's required to, you know, keep up with the coursework that you get, the data camp assignments that you get, the, assi uh, the final capstones and all the tiny projects that you have to do as part of the coursework. But in terms of figuring out whether or not you can commit to this program, something for transparency that I'll also let you know is that we do have an attendance requirement for the program. Any successful graduate has to complete has to attend at least a minimum of 80 percent of the classes so if you're expecting to just log to not log into the program and keep up with everything asynchronously that's not an option that's available because like it's a 10-week program which means you can add max mix miss like two weeks of classes and then you're at the edge of whether or not you'll successfully graduate from the program so that's also something to keep in mind while you apply for this and just to add to what Ayushi said, it's not just that the option is not available, it's that you will just not be able to keep up if you don't show up uh, at least 80% of the time, you know, because everything does happen in live class in the sessions. If you're missing the sessions, you're basically missing the program. There's, there's really no point. 
In the chat, Michelle asked, when is the next cohort? Um, and so it will run uh, later this year, October 7th through December 20th, 2024. Um, but the application period is already live uh, because of the many steps that Ayushi had mentioned earlier and that are detailed on the page. If you do want to get into this year's cohort, um, you'll wind up completing the Python pre-screen uh, within the next within the next few weeks. Uh, we close that on July 15th. Um, so that's the window of, of access. Uh, there's a question here, which I think Thomas or Ayushi, one of you can answer. This is one of the three uh, sent questions. Um, what are the chances of being selected if you already have a solution that uses AI to solve relevant social problems? I think this has something to do with the written application process. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you're already, uh, you have your hand in uh, creating your own AI in order to solve problems, that's that's exceptional. You're already applying uh, data uh, and applying AI towards, towards this. Um, there is an opportunity in your application to be able to speak about your experience. And um, if you were to make it through uh, to the, faculty interview, you could probably count on us asking you a lot of questions about that because the interview process, it, it's a short period of time. It's only about 20 minutes, but it's about the faculty trying to get to know you and what drives you um, as kind of economically a, as possible. Um, and so, so please share that interest with us. Um, and know that it is likely that during the course of the Applied Data Institute, if you were to be accepted, that you would be asked to also kind of cast your imagination wider than the thing that you're already doing to think about what are some other impacts so that you and, and other members of your cohort are creating a new in the same, uh, at the same time and in the same space. We have a few but questions on the chat. I'll just read it out so that uh, it's there for everyone. How much of Python knowledge is needed intermediate to industry experience? Is that enough? Can computational social science be experienced with data analysis and policy? I think these two questions, uh, if some of either of you can answer. Yeah, so um, in terms of Python knowledge, of course, it's a tricky one. It's hard to like I, if, if I were to try, start listing out skills, I think that would be a bit of a tedious answer. Um, again, what intermediate means, I'm sure differs from context to context. Certainly you don't need industry experience. Um, you know, there's a lot of industry relevant skills that are, are absolutely wonderful and worth pursuing, but, but you don't need that uh, in order to get in. But I would say that you, you will find that it might be the bar might be a bit higher than you expect. So ultimately, the reason the pre-screen is there is it doesn't hurt to to you know submit your details, get a copy of the pre-screen. If you look at it and you go, "Wow, all of this is a piece of cake," then great. Uh, you know, do your best and 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 you go go from there. If it's way over your head, then you go, "Okay, well that's way over my head and I can't do anything about it." Um, so I think that that ultimately I would say I would call it intermediate. But I, again, I, I worry the intermediate might mean something different for you than it would mean uh, for me. But in terms of industry experience, no, you wouldn't need any industry experience. Um, you would probably need some amount of ability to work with data using pandas. Uh, and to that extent, perhaps it's industry relevant. Uh, but again, any sort of fancy things that you actually do in pandas that, that might be really needed in industry, you probably don't need in this context. Um, the second question, I'm I'm if... Glorious, if you could rephrase it, perhaps, I'm going to try and parse what I think you mean. Can computational social science be experienced with data analysis and policy? Um, I think that's a huge aspect of what computational social science is. Again, uh, the, the folks coming in have different interests. So I think that the the both the Applied Data Inst uh, sorry, the Applied Artificial Intelligence course and the Foundation data, of Data Science course tries to draw examples from different uh different domains um, and and policy and sort of the social aspects of, of data uh, are huge. So you will hopefully get some solid exposure uh, into computational social science. And in terms of other programming knowledge, I think I saw uh, a question 
um, a pre-submitted question related to that as well. Um, I would say that yes, other programming knowledge is super relevant. And in my experience, if you already know a programming language quite deeply, you can learn another one very quickly. But unfortunately, given the pace at which things happen in the ADI, it, it's, it, it would, the onus of catching up in Python would be yours. And, and, and so realistically speaking, if it's something where you can spend some time, take out a week or two, learn Python, and then tackle the, the pre-screen, and you do a, a, a good enough job in the pre-screen, then that's essentially the litmus test for whether you know Python well enough or not. But given it's the medium of instruction, it's a little bit like having uh, instruction in in English versus uh, French. It's not it, you know there's nothing particularly great about English, but it just happens to be our medium, um, and and it's similar with Python, right? So unfortunately, just for the purposes of of being able to cover everything we want to cover in, we we have to be, be able to to work in Python. I hope that answers I, the questions. One thing I wanted to stipulate, since we've been talking about the application process, that you get twenty four hours to fill out the pre screen. Um, it it should not take you 24 hours to complete the pre-screen theoretically. I, I just sometimes there's that like, oh, I have to, I have to do a 24 hour test. And there's a no, no, you are given 24 hours in order to complete the pre-screen, but there is a time limitation on that. And so when we say make sure that you have time within the next 24 hours to fill it out, and, and you'll you'll see kind of a big alert on that before you submit your your um, submission before you get the the notebook. Um, that's all we're thinking about. Not that you need to have 24 consecutive hours with nothing else to do but fill out notebooks. It's not that 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 onerous. Um, but but if yeah, don't don't like hit submit and then be like cool. But I'm going to be offline for the next 24 hours. Well, then you've missed your shot. Yeah, and and just to sort of build on that, the pre screen, especially this year is quite open-ended in the sense that it's really the onus is on you to demonstrate your skills. Uh, the questions are designed so that you can take them to whatever degree. Uh, you can run with the questions to whatever degree you want to. Um, so it really is just a chance for, for me as an instructor to get to know where you stand in terms of your Python programming. Uh, Thomas Pasi, there's a question from Jacob on the chat, uh, who is an alumni of Naudi Tech. If you could just go through that question and answer it. Let me read it. Um, the question is, once we learn through the 10 weeks, can, can be applied to various fields, right? Like at the moment, I'm trying to go into cybersecurity and I feel some knowledge of data analysis and AI would be helpful. Um, Oh, perhaps it's what the question is, can what you learn through the 10 weeks be applied to various fields? Um, I, I, in a way, kind of think that as we look at our alumni as well, who have taken these skills and moved into uh, various outcomes, yes, that bears out. Um, I don't think there's any alum on the call who's like directly working in cybersecurity um, who can speak to that. But not everyone is, um, uh, you know, the, the, the three of you, Tina, Linda, and Lobby, aren't doing the same thing. I wonder if maybe there's just like a little capsule like, hey, what are you doing right now in your careers um, post Applied Data Institute, you know, in the years post Applied Data Institute, it doesn't these even necessarily have to be like, well, because of the Applied Data Institute, I now do this. Just like, what what are you doing to kind of get a sense of the breadth of of where these three alumni are? Tina, can I hand it over to you first? Sure. Um, I'm a product manager at an e-commerce company in UAE, and I work primarily on the seller side. So not on the regular customer apps, like you logging into Amazon, but like how a seller would sell their product. So it's a pretty cool field to be in. Yeah, okay, I'll uh, go Linda. next. Yeah, great, Linda. <laughs> okay, so for me, I work as a at the analyst of the scientist in an agri-tech company. And what I do mostly is I help in doing remote sensing and also just doing things like GIS, like, uh, downloading data from different video sites such as NASA. So I think I maybe I can just answer maybe the person who had asked the question. Uh, despite the fact that you are you are 
going into cybersecurity. I believe right now, like the world is changing and things like data analysis is required at most in all fields right now. And also AI is taking at most every industry, like the way the world is changing. So I think it will be beneficial and I don't think there are no any limitations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm working as data scientist also. Um, right now I'm working in a company uh, called Cloud Factory and it provides workforce solution for machine learning and business process optimization. So basically what we do is we try to find uh, if there is any kind of anomalies um, and other things that we do. So basically that. Excellent, legitimately proved my point. You're able to take these skills and work across multiple different, but incredibly impactful sectors. Um, so thank you, thank you to the three of you for filling that in, and thank you, Jacob, for your question. Um, and thank you, Ayushi, as well for filling in some of the um, you know, some of the kind of straight ahead, especially like numerical or timeline questions that folks have put into the chat. Um, we, we do accept around 25 students in each cohort, um, and we tend to run the Applied Data Institute during the same season every year. So it's the end of 2024. For those of you who are interested perhaps in uh, not applying this year, but applying in 2025, it would be likely to be around the same time uh, in, in subsequent years. Um, and then uh, Nabin as well, thank you for giving you, uh, your uh, qualitative experience of having taken the pre-screen assessment uh, within the last couple of days and kind of affirming uh, that intermediate uh, Python skills sounds about right. Um, that's great. Are there any other questions before we adjourn? We really do appreciate your time uh, and your interest and we hope that this has been helpful as you uh, consider uh, and prepare for your own applications to the Applied Data Institute.